Hey, drag fans, please listen up. I'm Alaska. And my name is Willem. And we are the hosts of Race, Race Chaser, Chaser, the premier and preeminent RuPaul's Drag Race recap podcast. And if you aren't listening to this podcasting behemoth yet, start right now. Because it's 2023 and we have weekly coverage of the all new episodes from the season 15 of RuPaul's Drag Race. Every Wednesday, we will discuss, dissect, and, and disseminate, disseminate all of the juiciest moments, wildest runway looks, and the shadiest reality TV twists of the best show on television drag race <laughs> race chaser with alaska and willem is the ultimate backstage pass for both drag obsessives and new fans alike so don't wait find us on your podcast apps and listen check out new episodes of race chaser every wednesday and friday wherever you get your podcasts thank you absolutely oh, a warm and right. warm and praise <laughs> yeah you should feel like you're walking into a hot tub basically. <laughs> that's the feeling that we're gonna go for Oh, is there a script? Yeah, script really like kind of ratchets up the pressure. Ha la 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 la. <laughs> me, 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 me. Okay. Hey, how to listeners. I want to share some very exciting news with you all today. It has been a fantastic adventure and a privilege to host this show for the past year and a half. And one thing I've learned is that I definitely don't have all the answers. And I could use some help. So we decided to bring on a co-host to offer a different perspective and a richer conversation. And so I'm really excited to introduce or actually reintroduce you to Carvel Wallace, who was a guest host on a recent show we did about how to parent a depressed teenager. Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. I'm so honored um, to do this. Carvel is a New York Times bestselling author a memoirist, someone who was creating beautiful, thoughtful podcasts way back before it was cool, before everyone had a podcast. <laughs> he covers race, art, <laughs> culture, film, music for a bunch of news outlets, including the New York Times Magazine, GQ, other places. And I guess I wonder, when you think about this show compared mm -hmm. to the other shows you've done, mm -hmm. How does it fit in? What is the what is the story you're telling yourself? Well, I'm always <laughs> I'm always interested in um, things that we struggle with emotionally. Like that's always going to be one of the things that I, um, you know, because I, I think being a human being is so hard um, and mm -hmm. weird and funny and interesting. And I think um, so. One of the things that attracted me to how to was the way in which we um, delve almost technically into some of the mushier, um, <laughs> aspects of how do I do stuff in relationships? How do I manage fears around my job? How do I, you know, just like all the stuff it takes to just like be a functioning adult in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. And this isn't your first advice rodeo, as I recall, right? Yeah. Some of you may know me if you're an old time slate listener, um, from mom and dad are fighting, uh, the parenting advice show. And I also, um, co-wrote the Karen feeding column, um, for slate. And most importantly, I'm a parent. I have two kids who are 19 and 17. I'm based out here in Oakland, California, and I'm super, super happy to be here. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. And how this is going to go is Carvel is going to host some weeks and I'll host other weeks. And then all of us will be working together behind the scenes with our amazing producers, Derek, Rosie and Kevin, to figure out the perfect shows and experts and how we can be most helpful to you and whatever you're struggling with. Yeah, that's exactly right. All right. I can't wait to hear the episode. Thank yes. you so much for doing this. And I'm excited yes. for uh, adventures to come. Yeah, me too. All right, let's begin. Welcome to How To. I'm Carvel Wallace. I was thinking about my work lately, and I realized that pretty much everything I write, uh, at least in my mind, comes down to love on some level, like personal love, political love, community love. All these stories that I work on always come down to people trying to figure out how to love what needs loving and how to get over the things that stand in the way of loving and whether that's loving someone else or loving ourselves it always ends up being about love which is why i was especially drawn to this week's question from our listener rel i'm just a great fan of the show and i i listen to each episode even if it isn't directly relevant to my life and i thought i would right in with the thing that I'm struggling to kind of let go of, and it's a condition with my eye that I was born with. Colloquially, it's called a lazy eye, and I just feel like it's that ugly thing I can't let go of. 
As Rel explains it, her eye isn't receiving all the information from her brain. She underwent surgery as a kid, which didn't fully correct the eye's function. And ever since, her eye's appearance has been this way. It has had a mark on my life. I've almost failed job interviews for not looking at people directly. It's not my style <laughs> to make eye contact either because of the eye issue or because I'm worried someone will notice <laughs> the eye issue. I feel like it's less about the eye. It's about letting go of that thing that um, you feel that there's a spotlight on. <laughs> what has your relationship to self-confidence been like, oh, like yeah. growing up and is it different now? How has it evolved over, over time? It's funny, my, my youth up to age 10 or 11 or 12 or whatever, I probably wasn't conscious of it. And then everything hit. Then it's the lazy eye. And I'm, I'm a person who's biracial in a white family and that hit. And body image, all of it. I think I've learned from a very early age that looking at my face can make people feel uncomfortable. Mm. They blink because they're like, there's something wrong with my eye. You know, it's mm. like, I'm not, there's something not computing here. So to avoid all that, I'm not likely to look you straight on. I was fortunate to get a new doctor uh, at, at one point in the last five years, and, and I live in this bubble that, oh, it's not that noticeable. And first thing, within seconds of meeting me, he said, mm. okay, what's going on with your eye? Is, is that an injury? What's happening there? And I thought, oh. oh my God. <laughs> so I was like, okay, it's a little tiny part of my face, and they can just, they can see there's this lack of symmetry or whatever it is. Those moments kind of jolt me back into a, a version of my reality where I, I feel it's, it's obvious. At some point, does it feel like you have to hold everyone's reactions that you interact with and that's part of the burden? That like you don't just get to be yourself, you also have to deal with every single person's reaction? 100%. And, and there's a mix. I have a unique name. My race is not obvious, right? There's so many things right. I feel like I'm on the hot seat and in my heart I'm introverted. <laughs> And I've been shy, I'm less shy now. So there's just this exhaustion. I have to hold all that and I have to pick which thing I'm going to explain if I'm going to yeah. explain it. So on today's show, we're going to face Rel's question head on. How do you learn to love your face? Or really, any physical trait that's created years of avoidance and self-consciousness. Should it even be on you to embrace it? And how do you deal with strangers' reactions ad nauseum? Joining us in this conversation is the award-winning playwright and author, Sarah Rule. My first reaction is just tears. Like, partly mm. the vulnerability of hearing you share your story with me brings me to tears. And also, I relate with so much of it. Sarah opened her book, Smile, the Story of a Face, with this beautiful passage about her experience with Bell's palsy. Ten years ago, my smile walked off my face and wandered out in the world. This is the story of my asking it to come back. This is a story of how I learned to make my way when my body stopped obeying my heart. Sarah is going to help Rel make her way toward love, acceptance, and finding the mirror that matters most. And if you don't think this applies to you, well, I'm pretty sure most of us have something we're a little self-conscious about when we meet somebody new. So definitely stay with us. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card is designed to help you pay less interest. Unlike other cards, it estimates how much interest you'll owe and suggests moves to help you pay off your balance faster. Also, you can keep more of your money. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, interest estimates on the payment wheel are illustrative only and may not fully reflect actual interest charges on your account. Estimates are based on your posted account balance at the time of the estimate and do not include pending transactions or any other purchases you might make before the end of the billing period. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening now are probably multitasking at this very moment. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving or cleaning or exercising or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now, and that's getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you can save money by doing it right from your phone. 
Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so that you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. On the day after Sarah Rule's twins were born, she noticed something had changed. A lactation consultant had come in to teach me how to breastfeed two babies at the same time. And then she said, your eye looks a little droopy. And I thought she was being like kind of rude. And I made a joke about Mm -hmm. being like Irish, you know, because my uncles, when they're drunk, their eyes, you know, fall down. She's like, that's not what I'm talking about. Look in the mirror and my whole left side of my face had fallen down and was paralyzed. And it was such a shock because I was one person inside before looking in the mirror and Mm. felt like I was another person after. And I was diagnosed with Bell's palsy, which is paralysis of the seventh cranial nerve. And it's idiopathic, meaning people don't totally know why you get it or whether it will get better, which can be really frustrating because they'll say, it will probably get better within three months, but we don't know. You might be a person for whom it never gets better. By that point, you were already... I would say something of a public figure as like a renowned writer. And and I wonder if this changed the way that you interacted with your career, particularly the kind of public facing part of it. I retreated. I tried not to. I, I tried mm. not to retreat, but I think I did. I mean, the most, to me, kind of hilarious but sad example is I had just been nominated for a Tony Award for this play in the next room or the vibrator plane, it was right after I'd gotten the Bell's palsy and uh, we had to go to this vanity fair thing where they take your picture um, of all the nominees and I didn't want to go and my agent said, you should go. So I was standing there on the red carpet and this phalanx of photographer was like, smile, smile for your Tony Award. Mm. And I was just like (laughs) really doing my best. And they're like, what's wrong with you? Aren't you happy? Can't you smile for your Tony Award? And I said, actually, I can't. My face is paralyzed. And they're like, oh, they're like totally chased and did not know what to do with me. But with Bell's palsy, there's definitely the feeling of managing other people's reactions. And for me, for a long time, not wanting to try to smile or laugh because that gave rise to needing to explain because that's when my face sometimes looked like it was grimacing particularly in the early phases. And I think also the effect on the self of creating that neutrality. I think for you, it sounds like it's looking away. And for Mm -hmm. me, it was sort of not, not smiling, not making expression on my face. It led to a removal from social, (laughs) social life, social engagement, Mm -hmm. a kind Mm -hmm. of ghosting and also mm. um, an inner expressionlessness because I was manifesting an outward lack of expression, engagement. Mm. And I feel like you came so to the right place in terms of me because not only do I have this asymmetry, but um, my, my two of my kids have amblyopia. My son had surgery when he was, I think, three to move his eye over. And so I, I'm well aware of you know, part of how that goes. And I also am an introvert, so I also identify keenly, Mm. (laughs) keenly Mm -hmm. with that. And I'm married to a biracial man who often decides whether or not to explain where he's from or what his ethnicity is. Um, Anyway, Mm. I I relate so, so much with everything Mm. that you're saying. You know, it's interesting for me because the one like link that I keep seeing is this, this feeling of having to hold the weight of other people's need to understand and process your story along their framework. Mm -hmm. For me, one of the experiences I have with that is that it generates a fair amount of like sort of silent resentment inside me. Like I'm just annoyed that I constantly have to organize my whole life around the parts of me that defy 
explanation or that other people need to have explained, that gives me a certain amount of resentment. And I might turn that inward. I, I tend to be more of a depressive type of person. But I'm wondering, Rel, if you experience like resentment or anger or frustration ever at all. Yeah, I, th I think it's a great question. Um, I almost failed a, a competition and in government, we call that a process to get a promotion. Mm. And I didn't realize it until I asked for the, the feedback afterwards. And they said, yeah, we just about failed you for oral communication. You weren't looking at us. You were looking at the wall. I was so disappointed and frustrated. It wasn't whether my answers were solid or well prepared. <laughs> it was mm. some, some optics things. And I also want to just land a little bit on what Sarah said around when to explain. I, I guess I don't feel I get to get a moment to explain it in a moment that feels comfortable to me. So mm. should I go into interviews again or whatever, social interactions, blind dates, whatever it is, do I have to front with this when I have a lot of other interesting things about my life that right. I would like to share? Right. So for an interview um, in person, for sure, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to handle it differently because I didn't like that I got, I felt like I got kind of penalized. But I don't consider this a disability. It is more of a visual thing that's happening with my face. I don't see in 3D. There's lots of other, you know, you don't want me as your tennis partner. <laughs> I'm holding <laughs> that railing when I go downstairs. I've fallen downstairs before. My depth perception doesn't exist, et cetera. But I feel it's minor until others make it more major. And then I, then I struggle with how to calibrate to the responses. Mm. I think the question you pose about when to explain is such a deep one in terms of how much you want it to foreground your identity. And, and there were times when I found an explanation really was, was helped me, like diffuse things, helped get it out of the way. And, and sometimes it felt a little stilted, but it did help the conversation that came next, you know, like a little palate cleanser, meeting parents at kindergarten for the first time, I would say. Just so you know, I might seem unfriendly. I actually am friendly, but the left side of my face is paralyzed, so it doesn't seem like I'm friendly all the time. They go, oh, okay. And then we'd move on, and I would do it, you know, in those situations or teaching or sometimes in professional settings. And I found that the more I did it, actually, the less I had to explain, which I don't know what that means, Maybe mm -hmm. it's that my face was also getting progressively better and I could show more emotion as as the years passed. But I think in a funny way, the explanation was for myself as well. So that the more I, I explained to other people, it was like a kind of coming out, like instead of let's have this tacit agreement that we both, you want to ask what's going on with my face. <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like instead of that being um, subtext, it just kind of makes the subtext text and it helped me to move on. Mm -hmm. I'm just learning from that, that maybe there are certain situations it would just be easier to front it. I had an example recently. I've just uh, switched jobs. I'm a manager and I was meeting my team one-on-ones and I had a sense there might be something going on with one of my team members' eyes. And it was like this relief that I could be like, oh, I'm going to talk about my eye. <laughs> this can be great. Yeah. And I said, yeah. hey, just so you know, if I don't appear to be looking at you, maybe I'm not. Because there's, uh, anyways, I think, and this woman very generously shared where I was injured in a, in a childhood accident, didn't work at all. And it was like this moment of bonding. And um, that was a one-on-one -on -one in a very uh, small room. <laughs> I just felt it was uh, a safe, I sensed there would be a connection there. Uh, that was all very lovely. Um, and I liked the example Sarah gave. So it just makes me kind of pensive about, huh, when could I have a script? And in general, I don't. Yeah, in general, I don't. Well, because it f can feel sort of, um, I don't know, it can feel weird and it can feel rote. I don't really want to take up space in that way. So I have to push myself to do it. What is it about the self erasure and also the kind of mirror neurons when you find someone else who is the same, who helped, like that woman in the situation? Mm -hmm. There's one incident in the book I talk about where I finally have lunch with someone else with unrecovered Bell's palsy, this this man, Jonathan Kalb, who wrote about it in The New Yorker. And I remember reading it at the time and almost not wanting to read it because 
It was so painful to imagine that I might not recover. And Jonathan talked so heart- heartbreakingly about not recovering. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. finally, yeah. when I was writing the book, I thought, okay, I have an excuse to come. So I finally reached out and he was so happy to have lunch. And just the fact of seeing his face and having compassion for his face and thinking when he would laugh and sort of turn away because when someone with Bell's palsy laughs, it can look asymmetrical or like a grimace. And I thought, no, look at me, stay with me. I know what it's like. Or when we were eating and, you know, food would like dribble out or something because sometimes it it can be hard to eat a big bite with Bell's palsy if your muscles aren't working properly. And we could just laugh about it. It was so healing for me, just a Mm -hmm. single meal, you know? And Mm -hmm. I think, God, how do we... We silo ourselves. We keep each other from having these connections. And, or at least I, I did because I'm, I think, so introverted. And I look back and I thought, mm-hmm. why did I not join a Bell's Palsy support group? Like immediately. Mm-hmm. What a relief mm-hmm. that would have been. It's very, very, very deeply nourishing that this conversation. But I think one thing that sort of sticks with me is how much is on us and how much is on others mm-hmm. to be like, can you just deal with difference? right? Mm-hmm. Can you just recalibrate and not not quiz me about it or like have your reaction and then move on, right? Couldn't this be part of just body positivity and honoring difference and not putting it on me? As much time as we've spent talking about our inner tension and fronting conversations, At what point can we say it's just on others to deal with it? We'll try to answer that right after this quick break. It's time to reboot your credit card with Apple Card. Apple Card is designed to help you pay less interest. Unlike other cards, it estimates how much interest you'll owe and suggests moves to help you pay off your balance faster. Also, you can keep more of your money. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start using it right away. Subject to credit approval, interest estimates on the payment wheel are illustrative only and may not fully reflect actual interest charges on your account. Estimates are based on your posted account balance at the time of the estimate and do not include pending transactions or any other purchases you might make before the end of the billing period. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, when you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you could save money by doing it right now from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average. And auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. Hey, drag fans, please listen up. I'm Alaska. And my name is Willem. And we are the hosts of Race Race Chaser. Chaser. The premier and preeminent RuPaul's Drag Race recap podcast. And if you aren't listening to this podcasting behemoth yet, start right now. Because it's 2023 and we have weekly coverage of the all new episodes from the season 15 of RuPaul's Drag Race. Every Wednesday we will discuss, dissect, and And disseminate disseminate all of the juiciest moments, wildest runway looks, and the shadiest reality TV twists of the best show on television drag race (laughs) race chaser with alaska and willem is the ultimate backstage pass for both drag obsessives and new fans alike so don't wait find us on your podcast apps and listen check out new episodes of race chaser every wednesday and friday wherever you get your podcasts thank you 
We're back with Sarah Rohl, author of Smile, the Story of a Face, and Rel, who right before the break asked a very good question. Why is it on me to placate strangers about my eye? I totally agree. And I think that the thing that makes it tricky for the face is the possible misinterpretation Mm -hmm. of what the face is doing. So that, you know, you were talking about just being misinterpreted or which enrages me about your job interview. I agree. It should be part of body positivity, but sometimes it's these subtextual cues that people don't even know they're making emotional Mm -hmm. judgments unless you kind of say, look, here's the situation. My my face might be conveying something I'm not intending to convey, mm-hmm. which is really awkward because how we're taught is those cues are supposed to be silent and subtextual. Um, mm-hmm. And so to say I'm making it visible can be awkward, but at least then you can move on. I mean, I remember a similar situation with a doctor too when you said the doctor was like, what's going on with your eye? She um was asking if I had any conditions that would affect my child. And I said, well, I have celiac disease. She said, yeah. And she said, anything else? And I said, no. She said, well, I can see that you have Bell's palsy. And I was like, oh, God damn it. She can see it still. Because I think at that point it had been a year. And I thought, no one's supposed to still be able to see it. And I felt so seen in a way I didn't want to be seen, seen with a medical gaze. And yet other times it's helpful to feel seen like someone who was going through the same thing to say, I see you, I see what you're going through instead of all of my friends who pretended that they didn't see it or in fact didn't see it because they loved me and they 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 filled in the history of how they knew my face to be or react to them. You know, so I don't know if you make a distinction between intimates who know what your intentions are and strangers. I, I just love that theme and it, it comes back to Carvel's opening remarks. Like I, my best friends, like never noticed. <laughs> she actually said that I've never noticed. And I thought for me, mm. that's, that's lovely, right? That's, that's sort of where I would embrace what you're saying, Sarah, right? The all of me is there, this whatever, this eye thing, whatever it is. Or <laughs> Anyway, maybe that person just isn't an eye focused person. Mm. There's a frustration that Rel voiced about, um, why can't people just fucking deal with it? It made me wonder how you, Sarah, in particular, recognize the difference between this is a thing I need other people to do differently, and this is a thing that I just have to accept that this is how people are going to be, and I need to deal with this uh, in my own particular way for me. I feel like it kept shifting, kept shifting mm-hmm. as, as relationships between self and other always are shifting. And as we make mm-hmm. the self based on a social self, like I remember I had this production of my play, Passion Play, very soon after the Bell's Palsy. And my mother was sitting on my um, Bell's Palsy side and she's an actress and she had had Bell's Palsy. Anyway, mm-hmm. she um, was watching the show. And she kept checking in with me nervously, like just looking at me. And finally she whispered, Mm -hmm. are you not pleased? And I said, I'm very pleased. I have Bell's palsy. My face can't (laughs) move. And she's like, oh, my God. And she felt so bad that she was my own mother. She had had the condition herself. And still she was so conditioned to read my social cues that she felt nervous and felt the need to check in. So I don't know. I don't know what the point is where you just think, deal with it. I'm not explaining myself. And when it's helpful to the self to explain, I I did feel writing the book for me was incredibly healing and making Mm -hmm. a narrative out of what had happened to me made me so much less angry. I mean, you talked about, I think, mild irritation. For me, it was rage. I was, Mm -hmm. I was enraged about what was happening. My, Mm -hmm. my experiences with doctors, the fact that I wasn't getting better, my inability to express myself produced so much rage. And I, I'm a fairly mild-mannered person, so it didn't manifest outwardly. It was just buried. And somehow writing a book made sense of it for me, and I'm, I'm no longer angry about it. So I do think putting language to it and not having mm-hmm. it be buried in non-language, for me, helped me get it out of my, my viscera somehow. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. 
though I've said low grade in irritation, I the word I'd written in my notes is there's actually just a lot of shame. <laughs> As I'm listening to your your journey uh, on the medical side, uh, one of the things I want to let go of is all the energy I've spent in googling how to fix this situation with the eye. I mean, I had surgery as a kid, you know, very um, well-intentioned, um, may have made things slightly better, but didn't correct. But I was saying to one of the producers, oh, there's a Tetris game you can play that may correct the eye, you know, testing mm. that. They can put you in a dark room for two weeks, maybe rewire your brain. Like, the energy spent on <laughs> fixing this eye versus being at peace Um I'm weighing both of those things, the shame and the and the fixing and wanting to a different path out, like wanting a, it mm -hmm. is what it is. <laughs> I'm really struck, Ral, by your use of the word correct. And I, I know that that's like what it says, like we need to correct this, correct this. But yeah. um, is there a way in, in which this is viewed as already correct, fine as it is? Mm -hmm. Like, the, you know what I'm saying? That Not that like, yeah. boy, there's this correct way for things to be, and my way is not the correct way, and I just have to spend the rest of my life learning how to live with that and put other people at ease around the fact that my thing is incorrect. Like, you didn't choose this. Mm -hmm. You didn't make this happen. This isn't the result of some horrible thing that you did that you now have to suffer the consequences of. You literally were created and born. That's all you did. Mm -hmm. So how can that be incorrect is a question. And I'm asking that philosophically. Mm -hmm. That's so beautifully said. And I found a lot with having something that's chronic, there was always that toggling between I want to be done with this and accept myself as I am and the kind of late night Googling, how do I get better? I was so ashamed. I didn't even know I was ashamed about the mm -hmm. Bell's palsy. That's mm -hmm. how deeply it was buried. Because rationally, I thought, why would I be ashamed of this? This just happened to me. And yet it was persistent, you know, not wanting to look in the mirror, not wanting to look at people, hating how I looked in photographs, and feeling weirdly that there was something wrong with me for not getting better. People would ask me, well, why didn't you pursue more second opinions early on? Why didn't you mm -hmm. call that friend up who's a neurologist? Mm -hmm. And I would say, well, I guess I was ashamed. Mm -hmm. And I, I came to the idea that shame is when the body does something that you don't have control over, you know, that it's different from guilt where you feel you did something wrong, that there's something about shame which is about a lack of control. And releasing that is a big deal, I think, um, in terms of accepting oneself. People are terrified of sickness because like Sarah just said, we don't want to lose control of our bodies. Sometimes I wonder if that in and of itself is just the root of all ableism, which is the tendency to discriminate against anyone with any kind of disability. Of course, the ultimate irony is that we are all going to lose control of our bodies one day. That's just part of the deal. But during this stretch of time, this period in which we consider ourselves abled and healthy, there's a lot of anxiety around disorders and disabilities, which means if you are one of the people who is currently experiencing one of these so-called disorders or disabilities, you find yourself on the receiving end of everyone's anxieties. I think that's a really profound point. And I had read some kind of memoir about a, um, someone who's mis missing part of a limb his reasoning for why people kept saying, oh, what happened, what happened, is mm -hmm. if he'd say it happened at birth, which is my explanation, palpable relief. They're like, okay, well, I got through that. I'm probably going to be okay, right? Like this weird transference mm -hmm. of, is this going to happen to me? Is this going to happen to my eye? It evokes everybody else's vulnerability. Are, are my eyes going to stop working? It's like, mm, maybe they will. <laughs> maybe not for the same reason. So the question, I mean, and this is for either one of you, actually, um, because this is at least nominally an advice show, is given the fact that to be in any way, again, the hugest air quotes of all, disordered or disabled, puts you at the receiving end of every quote unquote able-bodied person's like anxieties about losing their power and autonomy. How do we survive that? How do we maintain our peace in our space, in our prosperity, in our full humanity in the face of all the energy coming towards us, especially when, as you mentioned at the beginning, Rel, 
it is a thing at which you don't even have to consent for people to recognize or acknowledge or engage with you about. As soon as they look at you, they see it. And as soon as they lay eyes on you, already you're in the crosshairs of their stuff. How do we keep ourselves together underneath that? There's a story that comes to mind after I wrote my book. I was talking to my editor on the phone in a car, and my daughter was maybe 12 and was in the back seat listening. And um, my editor was actually asking, would I classify my book as disability literature? She'd had mm -hmm. some question from a book club. We were mm -hmm. sort of going back and forth. Was it a disability? Did I take that moniker? Like, did I identify as such? We're talking about it. And afterwards, I got off the phone and I said, oh, that must have been interesting to you, Anna. And she said, oh, yeah. And I said, well, what did you think? She said, well, mom, I, I guess I always kind of thought that your face was this beautiful house and a wall suddenly fell down and crumbled and you kept trying to build it back up brick by brick and you couldn't quite. But when I look at you, all I see is my home. Oh my God. Mm -hmm. I thought, dear God, well, if she told me that, maybe I wouldn't have had to write this book. I would have been cured, you know, by her complete mm -hmm. unconditional oh love. Um mm -hmm. <laughs> But it took talking about it in public for mm. me to receive that love, to know about her love and acceptance. Mm. And mm -hmm. and I, I think in our world, we sort of talk about self-acceptance a lot, like that it's good to do and we should do it. And I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think there's something about the social self yes. where for me, like, Maybe I got it from my daughter. Is that wrong? I, I couldn't get it only from inside right. my little atomic universe. You know, mm -hmm. maybe we mm -hmm. get it from our friends, our coworkers, our parents, or a stranger we meet on the subway. I would like to think we could go deep inside our solitary selves or read a book and heal our shame. And maybe we can, but sometimes I do think it comes from another person who helps us mm -hmm. along the way. Mm -hmm. which is maybe the whole reason that this podcast exists, you know, that what you were saying at the beginning of this conversation about love and yeah. we're all a little bit mm -hmm. broken. Well, the like, the kind of like uh, self-love industrial complex as I, as I always <laughs> witness it now, and it's like some sort of public online iteration mm -hmm. does always strike me as remarkably tied into our general cultural belief that everything can be must be done by yourself mm -hmm. in, in other words not enough emphasis on community i mean I, I i don't know how we're supposed to navigate all the things we have to navigate without the love that can only be generated in community but i do think sarah that's a little bit of what you're talking about and to that end as you said in your email rel i have to say like this topic is not just about oh what do i do about this weird thing my face does this topic is about something a lot bigger. And it may be too early to tell this because we've just had this conversation and things of this level require some time to process. But Rel, how do you feel like you'll think about y your eye differently going forward? I think the two things that sit with me are, are Sarah really tuning me into the, that there may be situations where that little script on the cue card might be helpful. And so that's really quite a, quite a light bulb moment. And it makes me feel armed in a good way. <laughs> um, and then second, uh, just really profound to have it um, floated into view how much my love for others transcends their physical bodies and, and how that must be going in two directions. Mm. Asymmetry doesn't define us. In fact, asymmetry, I've come to realize, invites care. You know, that our vulnerabilities, mm. our fragilities invite the care of others. And mm. it's our, actually our perfections that are distancing that make people people think, oh God, I don't want to talk to that person. They're so perfect. But mm -hmm. in fact, our fragility, our asymmetry invites a beloved to say, I too, I too am asymmetrical. I, I too mm -hmm. walk through the world with, with some level of brokenness. So I'm just really moved that you wrote in. I'm really honored to be part of this podcast, which builds community in such a beautiful way. So just very, very mm. grateful to be here. A sincere thank you 
Terrell and Sarah Rule for letting us explore this with you. Before we let Sarah go, I asked her to read this final passage from Smile. As I near the end of this story, what I would like to say to myself is this. I would like to accept my face, my story, as it is written on my face, my joy. And what I would like to tell you, reader or listener, (laughs) though I don't know you, though I have never met you, is I love your face. I love your eyes reading across the page, the wrinkles, the furrowed brow, whatever asymmetries you might have, whether it's a yellow snaggle tooth like mine or a crooked smile like mine, all the lines denoting story. This mole, that scar, all our protuberances, battle scarred, wounded, incomplete, almost healed, barely healed, or never going to be healed in the outward sense, not in this lifetime, scar tissued, or just plain growing older. Oh, how beautiful you are. I want to cherish the wrinkle that is a marker of whatever it is that makes your joy hard won and human. A little prayer. May all the broken faces heal. May what appears to be broken actually be in the midst of an untold, unforeseeable healing. Is there something in your life that needs healing? Send us a note at howtoitslate.com or you can call us up and leave a voicemail at 646-495-4001. We would love to have you on the show. And if you like what you heard today, then give us a rating or review. Tell your friends. Spread the word far and wide. This helps us connect to more people. How To's executive producer is Derek Chan. Rosemary Belson and Kevin Bendis produced this episode. Merritt Jacob is senior technical director. Amanda Ripley is my co-host. And Charles Duhigg created the show. I'm Carvel Wallace. Thanks for listening. Hey, drag fans, please listen up. I'm Alaska. And my name is Willem. And we are the hosts of Race Race Chaser. Chaser. The premier and preeminent RuPaul's Drag Race recap podcast. And if you aren't listening to this podcasting behemoth yet, start right now. Because it's 2023 and we have weekly coverage of the all new episodes from the season 15 of RuPaul's Drag Race. Every Wednesday, we will discuss, dissect, and And disseminate disseminate all of the juiciest moments, wildest runway looks, and the shadiest reality TV twists of the best show on television drag race (laughs) race chaser with alaska and willem is the ultimate backstage pass for both drag obsessives and new fans alike so don't wait find us on your podcast apps and listen check out new episodes of race chaser every wednesday and friday wherever you get your podcasts thank you hey everybody it's tim heidecker you know me tim and eric bridesmaids and uh, fantastic four i'd like to personally invite you to listen to office hours live with me and my co-hosts DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe. No. <laughs>